to today's webinar. We're very excited to bring you two great presentations about mobility management and linkage programs to connect users and rides for specialized transportation. First, we will hear from Judy Shanley, Assistant Vice President for Education and Youth Transition at Easter Seals. She's also the co-director for the National Center for Mobility Management, or NCMM. She has extensive experience providing technical assistance, conducting research, and developing materials regarding accessible transportation, mobility management, and coordinated transportation. After Judy, we'll hear from Will Rodman and Dan Berez of Nelson Nygaard. Will is a principal at the firm and has more than 35 years experience in transportation planning. He's an authority on paratransit and other demand response services that enhance access and mobility. Dan is an associate and a co-author on the project with Will. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Judy and uh, get us started. Terrific. Thank you, Liz. And thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I'm really excited to be here to talk about mobility management. And um, on the first slide, you'll see my title, Linking and Getting Linked. As I go through the slides, think about not only how you can link with other transportation or human services in your community, how you can deliberately link, but also think about how your organization or agency could get linked. How can you be um, visible to others so you're part of a mobility management infrastructure? And um, on the next slide, some of the objectives that I have for this is um, I, I hope that you'll learn how to establish mobility management resources in your community, steps that you can take to either link or be linked with those resources. And secondly, I'm going to be sharing information about some really amazing resources, federal resources that I hope you'll take advantage of. And um, you know, the the work that I'm going to be talking about really is a great platform for the work that Will and Dan will talk to you about. Their whole report and, and research focused on linkages, and I think um, hopefully at the end of my discussion you'll be able to see the connection between mobility management and the kinds of linkages that are described in the NCHRP 832 report. So on the next slide, I hope that some of you, and, and I recognize some of the names of the attendees, so um, for others, I'm going to do a little introduction to our center. We are the National Center for Mobility Management, sometimes referred to as NCMM. And our mission really is to build capacity of the field at multiple levels to implement mobility management strategies. That could mean anything in a community because it's so customized and based upon the unique needs of a community. And ultimately, our goal is to really ensure that all people that need rides can get rides because of this mobility management infrastructure that's in place. On the next slide, I'll tell you a little about NCMM. We're a National Technical Assistance Center. Um, there are, are several that are funded by the Federal Transit Administration. We were launched in early 2013. We're going into our year three, four worth of funding. The center is operated by three organizations, Easter Seals, where I'm housed in Chicago, the national office the American Public Transportation Association, and the Community Transportation Association of America. And really in um, FTA's wisdom in funding us, the model that we have between human services and large transit and small community transit organization is really the model of what mobility management should be in communities around the country. We have an external evaluator, WESTEP, and as I mentioned, we're funded through a cooperative agreement with the Federal Transit Administration. And a cooperative agreement entails um, an, a rather intense relationship between us and the Federal Transit Administration. And we communicate frequently. And we really, um, as we hear trends and issues in the field, we share that with our almost our partner, FTA. And then they, in turn, will 
implement um, what we hear, some of the important issues that we hear into priorities, into circulars, and then conversely, if FTA is carrying out particular um, pieces of work, initiatives such as the Rights to Wellness Initiative, they'll ask our center to help them implement that. So we have a close working relationship with the Federal Trans Administration. On the next slide, you'll see some of the services that we offer, and it's not unlike RTAP or any of the other, other federal technical assistance centers that might be funded by FTA or even other federal agencies who might take advantage of those services. We offer technical assistance, and we've got, if you go to our website, you'll see that we've got regional liaisons. And those are your point people for our center. Um, they are the, the people that most closely work with states in particular FTA regions. We um, are uh, hopefully know the area well, know the people, know the cultures of the area. So if you go to our website, you'll see who your point person is for your state. We offer lots of webinars, training, information briefing, newsletters, similar to what RTAP offers, but our focus is on mobility management. We also have a really neat thing, excuse me, called the MMIP Practice Database. The MMIP stands for the Mobility Management Information Practices. And we often get questions about Hmm, I need examples of one call, one click programs. I need examples of volunteer driver programs. Or what is a community doing with rideshare, with Uber and Lyft? And so the practice database is a place that you can go and search and find communities that look like you, that look like your community or state, and identify those practices that are in those communities and hopefully you can replicate those practices. There's contact information, there's websites. We, we also include any supporting tools or materials that um, may come along with the strategy. So it's a place that you could go to to find practices. But also, we encourage you to submit your own practices. You'll see that the um, database is not so heavily populated now, and there's real apparent gaps in where we have strategies from. So we would love it if you would submit your own strategies. I know you're doing really amazing things out there, and it'd be terrific if others can learn from your experiences. As we move on to the next slide, <coughs> excuse me, this um, graphic kind of always sticks in my mind. Mobility management is about innovation. And this quote is, if you always do what you've always done, you'll always get what you've always got. So think of mobility management as, as kind of um, tipping the scales and, and innovative practice. I just got back from the Midwest Transit Association and State Partnership meeting in Kansas City. We heard a lot about mobility on demand, sandbox, and all the innovations going out on out there with smart cities. And mobility management is an opportunity for you to be innovative and creative in the types of services that you offer, in the partnerships that you have and the strategies that you implement. It's an opportunity to be creative and innovative and, and kind of doing things differently. On the next slide, um, in the NCHRP report, and I'm sure that Will and, and Dan will talk about this, they talk about um, linkages. They talk about linkages in a way that there's seven steps of intensity of those linkages. And um, the first is developing central repository. Um, second is a, is a deeper kind of effort to facilitate linkages where you're matching assistance. The third being trip planning assistance. Fourth is trip booking assistance. And finally, direct, direct trip booking where you're actually providing the service. And I was thinking about those steps and thinking about how it aligns with mobility management and mobility management systems. And not all states have mobility management. Um, not all communities have mobility management. And the people that do this role of mobility management sometimes aren't even called mobility managers. But that's less important than the function of what they do. And mobility managers do many of those things that are described in those five levels that the NCHRP report um, 
talked about, but a mobility manager, the role is really someone's a knowledge leader. They know about the kinds of resources in the community. They know about the individuals who the service um, supports. They know about the, the costs of those services and the hours of delivery of those services and the accessibility of those services. And the mobility manager would coordinate those. They would look at the particular needs of a rider or a group of riders and help to facilitate connections between the various modes of mobility and transportation. They serve as a catalyst. So it may be that a service, there's a gap in service in a particular area. And so mobility management seeks to fill those gaps. So they're a catalyst for connections or a catalyst for new services. They're a creator. So they may um, you know, bring resources through 5310 money, through money that comes through other funding sources, and create services where services don't exist. They're a communicator. They're a mobility manager or someone who is able to articulate and describe the kinds of services, the riders, the need for services in a community. And then finally, the mobility manager is a convener, someone that is able to bring every together to really address the gaps in service that might exist. Um, and if you, if you look at on the right-hand side the, the purposes and the role of a mobility manager and think about how that role and purpose is aligned with the um, levels of linkage that are described in the NCHRP report, there's much overlap. So I think mobility management is, uh, is a way to operationalize the kinds of services that are described in the report 832. So as we move on to the next slide, I hope that through my description of the purposes and role of mobility management, you have had an understanding of what mobility management is, but the key tenets of mobility management is that it starts and ends with the customer. So it's really person-centered, really focused on the needs of various riders. Older adults may not have the same needs as low-income individuals who may not have the same needs as individuals with disabilities or veterans. So really understanding the, the service needs of the customer or the individual is paramount. Um, and secondly, it involves an entire transportation network. It's really funny, when I started out, I'm an educator by background and I worked with youth with disabilities in, in getting them jobs after high school and working with employers and vocational rehab and transportation was always an issue. Um, the students needed mobility and transportation supports to go to college and to get jobs. And at that time, I was thinking about a bus or a train or, or kind of our traditional thinking about transportation. But what I've learned, and it's amazing to me how our industry has changed, I think about all the innovations in mobility. I think about the agencies that are using shared use kind of services and TNCs and shared ride and um, other, I've worked with some communities and particularly in rural areas who are using um, faith-based organization vehicles as part of their network in their community. I've worked with food and nutrition and service professionals to identify transportation resources that may come from industry or business that may not be using vehicles at a particular time and so they, um, a mobility manager would help connect the food and, and nutrition service operator for a summer meal program, connect them with the employer to use their vehicles at off-use off times. So our, our thinking about what transportation is has really changed. And I relay the story. I was working with Alaska, a community in Alaska, and dog sleds are a real important a component of their transportation delivery system. So I think our thinking about what mobility and transportation are have really changed. Important in this definition is transportation options, a menu of services, a menu of options for people. And I know in rural um, areas that's not always easy, but it's um, been interesting and exciting to see the, the kind of options that are, are developed in, in um, areas where there's less 
address transportation infrastructure. Things like feeder systems where a, a, a faith-based organization may use a van to get people to a certain pickup point at the start of a transit network. Um, volunteer driver programs, so important in areas where infrastructures don't exist. Um, so it's, it's, it's kind of, it's thinking creatively, thinking out of the box. But the, the overall message is that the mobility management is aligned with the needs of the community, ensuring that those needs are addressed. So I'd like to ask you in the next slide, um, and I know many of you probably are linked to mobility management, but how are you linked? One, um, I know about mobility management resources. Two, I participate in planning services. So you're more actively engaged in a mobility management network. Three, my system carries out mobility management service. So you're actually involved in the delivery and decision making of mobility management or some other way, which is number four. And here's the poll. And Liz, they click, do they click on it? Yeah, the poll should pop up and I see okay. people are responding. Um, so we've got all, we've got fifty percent voted. We'll just leave it open for a little bit longer and then we can share once I close the poll we can share the results. Okay. Terrific. So just leave it open a little bit longer. Ninety percent. I love learning about how people are involved in mobility <laughs> management. You know, because what I do is when I when I hear kind of your stories and your profiles of how you're engaged, I could share that with other people as examples. So, okay. Okay. So, so you should be showing, you should be seeing the poll results. Um, Twenty-five percent answered for number one. Six percent for number two, 56 percent carry out mobility management services, and then we'll have to look at the chat box for um, the other. So definitely follow through and tell us how you are involved in mobility management, um, and we can get that information uh, later. It will be really good for us to know. Perfect. Okay, Perfect. so um, we can, I'm going to hide that and um, go back to the presentation. Okay, perfect. You know, another thing that I forgot to say is uh, a national center uh, like the National Center for Mobility Management is a good opportunity and place for you to share strategies with your colleagues and your peers around the country. We've got discussion forums, we have webinars such as this where you can learn from each other and we have platforms where you can share practices so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So thank you for um, sharing. Your, your feedback with us. Um, the slide about steps to building, I'm just thinking about, you know, many of you are really engaged in carrying out mobility management services, but um, if um, you're not so engaged or want to even reevaluate how you're engaged or involved in mobility management services, the um, following slides really have steps to building and connecting and linking. Uh, First, I would, you know, and, and many of you probably are already doing this, and ensure that you have community forums. You know, this is a community effort, so, you know, whether you're at a state department, whether you're at an at a intermediate or a regional level or a local level, think about opportunities and forums that you can convene people, a diverse group, a heterogeneous group of people, and get the input and insight of what's going on in terms of community mobility in, in your area. And think about traditional and non-traditional, that's kind of out of the box thinking I was talking about, you know, traditional providers like rail and bus and taxis, but, but non-traditional like faith-based organizations, schools, medical facilities. I was just um, at the, when I was at the Midwest meeting, they were talking about how um, some of the hospitals in the area have uh, medical facilities, um, outpatient clinics have vehicles that could be part of the mobility management network. They've gone you know, unused uh, much of the time, and so they're another vehicle service that can be incorporated. Um, uh, TNCs, transportation network companies, um, Uber, Lyft, Bridge did an amazing presentation in their work with uh, Kansas City, and I know they're active in Boston, and 
in Kansas City, they've got a pilot going on that brings people to jobs. It's a, an employment service, kind of an on-demand, like a, a super shuttle that takes you to the airport, but it's um, purposed for, it's an on-demand kind of service. And then always look at access, access in terms of accessibility, the, the ADA accessibility, but also access in terms of first mile and last mile issues. On the next slide, there's uh, I've offered some ways to fill the gaps, and I've talked about some of these strategies, but things like sharing vehicles, sharing your own vehicles, sharing vehicles of other organizations. Um, some retail businesses and communities may have vehicles that they would um, lend to the mobility management infrastructure. Sharing rides, very popular, both um, you know the, the share ride services that we think of in TNCs, but also share rides um, for vehicles that may be owned by a particular faith-based organization or a united way in a community. Setting up volunteer driver programs. We've got lots of resources on our website site about volunteer driver programs, really innovative strategy, um, and it it could be um, it, it could be a volunteer service opportunity for service corps or a senior service um, program that federally would be able to fund it. Um, think things about rerouting. Um, I've had lots of conversations with places about maybe their vehicles were underutilized or inefficient because of the routing, and so thinking about repatterning how you can move vehicles. Voucher programs are really popular, and then vehicle purchase vehicles, mainly through FTA money or other foundation grants or other sources that may be available. The next slide, you know, the the one thing that I hear a lot is that we we've got 5310 money, we have the 5311 money, but it's not sustainable. So as you're building your systems, as you're connecting with mobility management, think about in the long run if these strategies could be sustained. And so one way that um, is, going to, is going to help you is if you're evaluating the service continuously and you're collecting data and you're using data to inform the practice and inform the strategy. Also, creating a communication system so other people know about what you're doing gives you um, uh, opportunity to create infrastructure and buy-in from others that may be not, not directly associated with your organization or your agency. Keep in contact with that network that you develop. Let them know how the service is going so that you've got their continuous buy-in. And market, market, market. You know, you're, you're all doing amazing things. Tell your story. Share your story through local, through state publications, through policy and legislative of offices in your state. On the next slide, I just I share with you, you know, FTA has this big, big initiative, Rides to Wellness, and we've been doing lots of work around there. They're going to be announcing um, uh, winners of a, a big 5.2 million grant program, and next year they said they're going to have the same program. So look at those programs, look at the grants that have been funded um, and, and the new ones that will be announced shortly, and think about how you can position yourselves and your community to respond to those future funding. The next slide, um, just wanted to quickly tell you about a new center that was just awarded. It's a collaboration between Easter Seals and N4A, which is the National Area Agency, National Association of Area Aging Associations for Aging, and 4 a um, and it's called the National Aging and Disability Transportation Center, NADTC.org, and um, their focus is going to be on 5310, the focus is going to be on accessibility, um, you may remember Project Action, the Easter Seals Grant, and also the Senior Transportation Center. The NADT Center replaced both of those, and so they're, they produce lots of really great information and um, provide training. They have a grant program out now. It's a $50,000 grant program for community building around accessibility and innovation. Um, these small grant programs can be tied together and add up to a lot of money, so take advantage of those. 
the next slide I just have the um, URLs for all of the National Technical Assistance Center funded by Federal Transit Administration as well as the Administration for Community Living. Um, I, I encourage you take advantage, use the materials from these centers, invite us in to any forums you have or any technical assistance needs that you have. We're, we're happy, this is our job and, and we love doing it, so take advantage of us. And then finally, I just wanted to say thank you. I put um, the URL for our National Center on there, and I also put my personal email. So if you have any questions that we don't address at the end of this webinar, I'd be happy to address them individually. So thank you for giving me this opportunity, and thank you for your time. Liz? Thank you so much, Judy. And if anyone has questions for Judy, we're going to um, address those at the end of the webinar. So I'm going to turn it over to um, Will and Dan. And I will just note that the webinar um, is slated to end at 3.30, but we're going to have them, uh, Will and Dan, present until 3.30. And we'll take questions after that. So hopefully, or maybe maybe we'll end at um, 3.25. But please stick around for if you have questions. We want to give them enough time to present. They've got a lot of information here. So um, we'll let them get started, but just a heads up about the timing. So um, Will? Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Will Rodman. I am with Nelson Nygaard Consulting Associates in our Boston office. I was the principal investigator for the Task 60 study, and I have with me Dan Perez, who's also with Nelson Nygaard and performed much of the research and analysis for the project and was my co-author. Um, I'll be delivering the first half of the presentation, and Dan will be delivering the second half. Uh, the, the, the presentation itself is going to focus on the findings of this research study which is part of NCHRP's National Mobility Management Initiative series of research tasks. This particular task, Task 60, focused on how state DOTs are connecting specialized transportation and users and rides, although, as you'll soon see, uh, most of the connections, or as we call them linkages, are, most, are, are, are much broader in scope. Um, and I also mentioned that the report and the toolkit which Dan will describe later in the presentation, is available online as volume one and two of the NCHRP report 832. Oops. Oops. There we go. Um, sorry, okay, so to tee it up, um, there are many types of customers, including those who depend on some kind of specialized transportation, but also the general population who have trouble getting around to different places for different purposes. And in some urban areas, there are many different types of services available. In other areas, and especially rural areas, there are fewer options. But in both urban and rural settings, one thing is true, and that's that many of the individuals who don't drive or don't have access to a car don't know what the full range of mobility options are that can potentially match their needs and they don't know how to access them. So, accordingly, state DOTs and planning organizations and local and regional transit agencies and senior agencies and 211 organizations and coordination councils have spearheaded new efforts or enhanced older efforts to provide a centralized repository of transportation resources that offer one-stop shopping for individuals and their families and caregivers, more accurate and up-to-date information, and they're easy to use. Some of the more advanced services offer something similar to Match.com, and while it won't necessarily match you up with your true love, they do allow you to put in specifics about you and your transportation needs and they'll sift through the options to produce a more manageable and actionable list of available services that match you and your needs. Um, indeed, the 211 systems have this in common. And some of the even more advanced systems also, um, as Judy mentioned earlier, offer trip planning services and even allow you to directly book a trip request on a particular service. And for some, you can do that on your smartphone. And it's these new linkages that do this, and this was the focus of the Task 60 study. 
So we were part of the ICF team for the project. Uh, we ended up doing the bulk of the effort and served as the technical lead. And before we get into the broader findings, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the VTCLI grant program jump-started the development and enhancement of a lot of these linkages. And because of that, we thought it might be appropriate to see what has resulted from those grants, at least at the time that this research was done last year. What the VTCLI program did, in short, was to build upon the basic idea of linkages. Prior to the VTCLI program, and as a result of the United We Ride and other coordination efforts, many states and regions and counties thought that establishing a centralized repository of information about specialized transportation resources was a good idea, and it was. Uh, most of these took the form of hard copy directories. Some appeared on websites, and some were augmented by staff that field the calls from customers for help and used these directories as a tool. So the VTCLI program took this idea and, and kind of supercharged it with the development of one-call, one-click systems that would offer far more effective technology. Um, these grants were issued all over the country to 119 recipients during 2011 and 2012 and totaled almost $64 million. And while the intent, the initial intent of the grants focused on connecting veterans and military families to mobility options, most of the grant recipients took on a much broader scope. Um, certainly, the state DOTs were a big player among the grant recipients, reflecting 41 or 35 percent of the 119 grants. And in 15 of those cases, the state DOT served or is currently serving as the lead agency, while the others reflected more regional approaches. And over on the right, you can see the list of the 15 state DOTs that were serving as the leads for those programs. Here's a slide that describes uh, what was done with the VTCLI grants. As mentioned previously, most grant recipients use the grants to establish or enhance or, or market the One Call, One Click program. Some had a one-call component and put the service online to compete to complete the one-click component. Some piggybacked on 211 or 511 systems, and a few built a center. And some added in-vehicle technology for coordinated operations. Um, oh, the reasons that the, the percentages don't add up to 100 percent is that some of the grants were used for multiple purposes. So, what did we find out there? In our research, we discovered three main takeaways. The first was that throwing all this money at the problem accelerated linkage program development and resulted in advanced functionality that wasn't on anybody's radar when the program was first conceived. The second takeaway in the focus of our presentation today is that these new linkages fall along a continuum of functionality from simple to advanced as portrayed in the graphic. And that each level has unique benefits and challenges and opportunities, and that sometimes the level chosen is commensurate with the budget available. And I might add that, that we portray each of these levels of functionality, keeping in mind that there are still places for which the lower or simpler levels of functionality are just fine and well suited. Um, and even at the lower levels of functionality, they represent a major improvement over what currently was in place, which is sometimes nothing. Now, for these folks in attendance um, who are still unsure about what level is right for your state or region, um, we hope that this presentation will give you a taste of what's out there, but that you really will benefit from the report and the toolkit in making that decision. So um, Judy introduced those, those options um, or the, those levels on the continuum earlier. Level one um, involves establishing a central repository of transportation services that may be available. A hard copy directory may be available online and may be used as a tool by mobility specialists on call. And some can be organized to anticipate the types of services that you might make with a more interactive service, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. One of the shortcomings of level one is that it, it almost becomes outdated the day that it's printed, and many agencies don't have the manpower to keep it updated. 
So the level 1A has in part solved some of this by making it easier for the service providers to update their information via an online portal. Level 2 is my Match.com example and, and may be best exemplified by those 211 systems where you as a user or a caller input key information about yourself and your trip and it narrows down the services that likely match your transportation needs in general or specific trip needs and then provides contact information. But the kicker is that you still need to then make the next call to that service. Um, in Travelocity lingo, level two would say to you, yeah, American and Delta served that trip, but it's then up to you to check them out. So level three provides trip planning assistance and may utilize links with transit agencies and carpool ride matching services and taxi fare finders and even TNCs like Uber and Lyft and gives you the details of the trip making including the exact schedules and fare uh, but for demand responsive systems it will still require you to make a call. So back to Travelocity, yep, it's American Flight 102 and Delta Flight 305 that are the possibilities. Level four offers the assistance of mobility specialist on call to help you book that trip. So in this case, there's a travel agent who's using the system to not only get the flights but book a reservation for you. Level five uh, actually provides you with an online tool, if not on a smartphone app, that helps you directly book the trip on certain services to which the system is linked. So to complete the travel velocity analogy, you, know, you, you set up a customer profile and you're able to make a reservation. And the next evolution, let's say a level six, um, which really doesn't exist yet, is going to be when you book a seat on American for the first leg and Delta on the second leg, kind of like using Travelocity, and then you can pay for both. Um, so we're going to look at some examples of some of the lower level functions and these are detailed as the case studies in the report in the toolkit. So we offer two example level one repositories that are somewhat unique beyond just the listing. These are from Will County, Illinois, outside of Chicago and from Denver. And we also present two 211 systems that reflect uh, level two and three respectively. Both are from Southern California. Um, the level two example from LA County and the level three example from the Inland Empire centered about San Bernardino. So the uniqueness of the Will County directory is that it's organized based on how you might do a search. For example, this page summarizes the dial ride services by town and whether they're available to seniors or persons with disabilities and or the general public. And interestingly, as they're portrayed here, it's easy to see where the spatial and eligibility holes are. And if you see when you like, it gives you the page number. In the directory in Will County, you'll also find a listing of countywide human service agency transportation programs also sorted by eligibility. And here's a summary of dial ride services by name, which also includes key characteristics, such as where and when services provided and how to get in touch with them. Um, a picture of the Getting There Collaborative from Denver, um, uh, their list of transportation services um, is provided in the report in the toolkit. And the uniqueness of this one is that they opted for a very low tech, but a very effective approach. What they did was they laminated a color-coded list of services as, as printed on a legal sheet of paper and distributed it. They laminated it and distributed it to senior centers to be used as placemats for congregate meals, and it was a big hit. Now, the level two examples we chose to highlight are from LA County, but truthfully, most two and one systems work exactly the same. By inputting keywords, such as the ones listed here, into the keyword search, as well as the zip code, the 211 will sift through all the services to narrow it down to the transportation services that reflect the type suggested by the keyword search and by the zip code. So one can do this uh, him or herself, or one can do it via 211 call taker who can do the search for you. 
And here's where the search criteria narrows down the list. And here's where detailed information is provided on one or more services that you selected, including how to contact them, noting again that you still have to contact the service. The, the onus was on you to make that call. And here is a, oops, sorry. Here's a good example of a level three screen showing a trip planning results from a souped up 211 vet link system from the Inland Empire. And again, through links, a particular trip request from a person who uses a wheelchair unveiled that there are three different bus routes that can serve the trip, as well as the regional paratransit service. And it provides when that trip could be taken on the route or service and the fare. And from there, if you select a particular solution over on the right via that, those red select buttons, it gives you a details of that route or service. Now, the case studies from the more advanced functional levels included two one-call centers in southeastern Michigan and a few different level five cases from Pennsylvania, Salt Lake City, and Jacksonville. So that the common aspect of the, the southeast Michigan case studies, one was led by the transit agency in Ann Arbor and the other led by a regional area agency on aging. So again, the common aspect is that they operate a call center with staff that will help you with those Match.com services and actually help you by calling the service of choice while you're on the phone. And they will book the trip on your behalf. The AAA, by the way, is now in conversations with their local transit agency, SMART, to see if they could use the DTCLI grant that they have to link the system with other paratransit scheduling systems in use in that area and they're, thereby going from a four to a five. And this is something that was solved in Pennsylvania, where PennDOT has paid for a common software scheduling system to be used by the state's county-based coordinating system. And a linkage was built between the one-click system and the software system so that customers could not only find the service of choice, but also book a trip on the county-based systems from their computer or smartphone if that's the service of choice. In Salt Lake City, UTA is doing something similar, but it's looking at a broader functionality, enabling the booking of trip onto different software packages. And in Jacksonville, the schedulers from one system can actually book an inter-regional trip onto a partnering organization system. In addition, the customers can use the system to book a trip on Amtrak or an inner city bus. And all these systems, as well as the VetLink 211 system, are products of a firm called Cambridge Systematics, who, was, who has built and provided more of these advanced technologies, uh, to several of these across the US. Um, and they also embrace the idea of open architecture so that links can be made with transit agency trip planning uh, software, taxi fare calculation sites, as well as paratransit scheduling software. Uh, here's an example of, of the cool system in Pennsylvania where in a progression of screens, an individual can find and book a trip on a specific service via his, smart, his or her smartphone. And note that the system is currently available in a seven county area of the state, but it's in the process of expanding to the entire state. And one of the lessons learned, by the way, from this was to keep the screen simple. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to Dan, who's going to discuss the strengths and weaknesses of these various levels, and also um, evaluating and marketing these services in the toolkit, which again is now available in the theater near you. So Dan and I are switching here, so he's close to the phone. Hello. Uh, so I'm. I'm going to go through these a little quickly since I want to be conscious of everyone's time. Um, so after we developed the continuum of functionality, we wanted to look at the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches from the perspectives of three different groups. Um, the uh, agencies that are developing the linkages, the operators that provide specialized transportation services in um, given areas, and the people who are using those services. Uh, so for each level, we'll go over strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities. Um, 
the strengths are represented by the dumbbell there, and the weaknesses are uh, represented by the broken chain. Um, so for level one, which again is the centralized repository, the strength there is that it provides a really easy to use source of information um, for people who otherwise might be um, looking at a wide variety of sources to find services that fit their trip. Um, and for areas with you know a limited number of transportation services, this is probably what uh, you know a good way for you to go. Um, the weakness is, is that it's often difficult to identify applicable services um, if you're in a larger um, area where there might be dozens of services um, that could uh, fit a variety of needs. Um, and also, because it's a static directory, you, you have difficulty with updating. So updating is going to require significant staff time, and most importantly, the directories are going to cut, if you have a large number of, uh, of potential, uh, of potential uh, operators, the directories are going to become out of date really quickly. And if your directory is out of date, people really aren't going to use it. Um, if you provide only through hard copies, you have to you know, make sure those hard copies are distributed and the updated versions are distributed. Um, and if you're uh, providing that directory online, you have to make sure that the people using it um, are able to access it via the internet and understand how to access it. Um, finally, uh, oftentimes these directories get created by one organization or one staff member in that organization. And if they're not designed very well, as new staff members come on and, and those old staff members leave, you, end up, you might end up with a pretty disorganized directory and again, if it's not easy to use people. Um, so and then the opportunities here. Um, so the you know one of the things that we talked about is that people uh, uh, have been putting these directories online, which widely uh, enhances the ability for them to be distributed at a very low cost. Um, and the will, as shown in the Will County example, you can really develop these to mimic the usability of a web-based uh, a web-based interface, um, which makes it really easy for the customers to use, but also easy for the linkage providers and operators. Um, to find holes where uh, trips might not be met. Um, and finally, once uh, you do put them online, there are analytics tools that can provide you some basic information about who is accessing um, the directories um, and what types of services they're interested in. Um, level A, uh, the real strength here is that it uh, takes the onus off the uh, uh, linkage development linkage directory developer um, by having providers update their service information directly. Um, the challenge here is that operators may not uh, regularly update their services, and they don't always follow the template that you're using, so your directory can get a little unorganized. Um, and we saw a lot of examples of this um, occurring. So you have to make sure that staff monitor and, uh, and uh, monitor uh, the uh, basically uh, the quality of each entry and whether it's been updated or not. Um, so level two expands on the uh, initial linkage service to provide a match.com, as Will described it, uh, services um, that use triage questions to identify what, uh, uh, basically it, it helps create a, a profile of the user. So a user may only may need door-to-door -door assistance, they may uh, need a vehicle that use a wheelchair, they may be going to a dialysis appointment, and this helps narrow down um, the types of transportation options they have for a given trip. But it's uh, not linked with schedule information, so once they develop a service, uh, find a service, they then have to contact that service to figure out whether that service can provide a, the specific trip they're looking for. Um, and finally, this can, um, an opportunity here from an evaluation stage or from a customer service stage is you can provide, if you're providing phone-based matching systems, you can follow up with an email or a follow-up phone call that provides additional uh, information about those services. Um, so level three is where you see kind of a big link in uh, jump in functionality. Um, the strength here is that it works similarly in many ways to Google Maps um, uh, or an Apple Maps-based uh, 
planner where you can input your, your specific trip and you can get some information back to you on the specific services that can serve that trip. Um, and it also has a lot of opportunities to link into information sources that aren't being produced by the linkage um, provider. Um, so transit schedules are often publicly accessible um, from a transit agency. Um, there are opportunities to add biking and walking directions, uh, online carpool matching, and taxi databases. Um, the, the issues here is that it's still not getting you all the way there. Customers still have to uh, contact a service provider if they need if they're if the mode they're using requires uh, booking and that becomes especially difficult when you're transferring between different services um, that require advanced booking you still you're going to end up with conference calls and multiple calls um, and one opportunity here that we're seeing uh, more linkage providers pursue is making this uh, linkage available through a, a mobile phone. Um, level four uh, takes that next step to provide more booking services. So, and here, you know, customers are going to contact um, a mobility specialist, and, and that mobility specialist has information on the different providers and can book trips on the customer's behalf. And this is really important with uh, tr uh, trips that require transfers, where multiple uh, providers have to be contacted and, and make sure that the trip can be completed successfully. Um, you know, so one of the issues here is that if for agencies that are looking to minimize the number of mobility specialists they have to hire, this, this method provides a lot more information to the mobility specialist that might reduce the time it takes to create the link, um, but customers are still contacting the mobility manager by phone um, for booking assistance. And that mobility specialist doesn't know if a trip is available when they initiate that call with the operator. Um, level five, you know, the strength here is that in many ways it's like uh, Travelocity, where you go and you say, you know, if you're a customer, you can go on an online application and you can figure out what services uh, will work for your trip and whether they have a trip schedule for the time you need to be there. Um, the challenge here is that you're providing a pretty complicated service, and when you provide that service, you're going to have a lot of coordination between different providers. And those providers might have already invested a lot of money in scheduling systems that aren't necessarily um, uh, coordinated with each other or coordinated with the linkage service that you were planning on providing. So you may um, have to invest more in developing new APIs or acquiring and deploying new software in order for a level five linkage to work. Um, and the opportunities here are, are pretty pretty significant. One, you can create an eligibility profile so that you know, users don't have to input a wide range of their needs. Um, each time they book a trip. Um, you can also use this to enhance awareness and potentially divert uh, people from one mode to another mode. Um, uh, you know, we see some providers who are looking to reduce, you know, to basically help their customers be more informed about um, accessible public transit options that might give them more flexibility than just relying on a paratransit service that has 24 hours advanced uh, reservations. Um, you can integrate it with vehicle tracking software to get a where's my ride um, style uh, information to customers, um, which can reduce calls to figure out where uh, when vehicles are running late. Um, and finally, and this is, this is definitely on the more advanced level, you uh, can get customers to actually be able to pay uh, while they're booking the trip, um, which should make it easier to uh, complete complex trips and also reduce some of the friction when you're uh, when you're scheduling and using the services. Um, so I'm going to go pretty quickly through this. There's a, there's a lot of information in our um, uh, toolkit and in our report about how services should be evaluated. Um, but the main thing here is that you can evaluate um, services through a couple, for a couple different reasons. Um, one is to justify the linkage program itself and attract additional funding. If you can prove people are using it and it's being successful, um, you know, this, that's important to maintaining and, and continuing to operate a linkage. Um, you can also use it to identify service gaps. So it's not just helping people find um, uh, services that meet their needs, but also finding out when there isn't a service that meets their need, either because the whole service doesn't exist or the services that do meet the needs don't have trips when people need them. Um, and then finally, you can collect robust customer feedback about the kind of services that they need. And this might help an agency that has developed a level two linkage realize that maybe 
they really need to be at a level four. Um, and it's really important to develop um, your evaluation criteria um, from the beginning so that they're, it's built into the process and not kind of built on top of the process later. Um, so these are just a few uh, examples of the types of evaluation criteria you can use and how, depending on what level um, of linkage functionality you are, what kind of questions can you get and what kind of um, answers can you get from those questions. Um, so the first is uh, looking at the total usage and frequency of usage by customers. Um, and you know, as I said earlier, it's important to understand who's using it um, so that you can both attract additional funding and build features that target um, the customer. Uh, the uh, the next is uh, the accuracy of the information. It's really important that these uh, these linkages are accurate. Um, and, uh, so with uh, with an earlier level, a lot of that accuracy is going to be done by the staff who are maintaining the linkage through uh, verification. Um, but as you get later, you can. Um, make you a lot more of the data that you're getting is automated, so it's much more just checking that the feeds are working than than checking whether the data that the feeds are providing are accurate. And you can also collect customer feedback. You know, if they try to use a linkage service and it turns out it doesn't exist anymore, the schedules are different. Um, the customers can provide that kind of information. Um, and then here you can also, you know, especially with the with uh, the later level of linkages or the more advanced linkages. You can figure out whether trips are being made successfully or unsuccessfully. Does a customer put in their information and their parameters and no results come up? Um, so you can get really robust information about that, especially as you start providing booking assistance. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so this is just an example of an of a, uh, output from the Cambridge Systematics uh, software. Um, and this you know, gives you an idea of the types of method, you know, whether people are using a desktop or their phone, what types of itineraries are being generated, and what types of um, itineraries are people actually using. Now, the Cambridge Systematics software doesn't require you to click through, um, but some softwares will be able to provide even more robust um, information, and Cambridge Systematics is definitely um, expanding on this data um, as they develop their software further. Okay, so. Um, as part of the uh, NCHRP task, um, we developed a toolkit for state DOTs, um, and this uh, uh, toolkit can be used by anyone who's developing a linkage, not just state DOTs, and it's available online. Um, so it's based around the continuum of linkage functionality and includes seven steps. Um, the seven steps are really designed to help you identify from the beginning what type of program you want to develop and then figure out how to develop that program and implement it and deploy it to your customers. Um, so the first thing here is figuring out what geog ge uh, geography you're planning on serving. Um, link it, you know, there, are, there, are benef yeah. there are benefits from uh, being at a larger geographic scope um, versus a smaller one. Um, the next thing is to look at who you want to serve and what uh, types of trips and modes they're going to be served on. Third, which is really important, is figuring out what you already have. You might already have a directory, and it might not be from your organization. It might be other organizations in your um, determined geographic area, uh, and it gives you something to build upon. From there, you can decide what level of linkage functionality you want um, and determine the types of way you're going to evaluate the service you deploy um, throughout the process. Um, Six is to evaluate what uh, sources of funding, which are going to vary widely based on what types of users and trips you're trying to serve. And then seven is creating a marketing plan that not only um, helps customers find out about the linkage service, but also helps providers and mobility specialists um, uh, to learn more about how the service works and how they should be using it. Um, so again, the spinal report and toolkit are available online, and we'd be happy to answer any questions now. Uh, about our research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Will and Dan. Um, so now we'll have time for questions about this presentation or Judy's um, introduction to mobility management. Um, as a reminder, you can type it into the questions uh, section of the control panel, uh, or you can raise your hand and we can call on you, in, especially if you have a longer question. Um, you can ask it over your mic and speakers or the phone. 
Um, so we'll start with one question that we that came in. Um, the question, the individual asked, or said, these are some really cool customer information and scheduling systems, but I can't help thinking that we need to be moving in the direction of everyone uploading data into an open data standard platform so that third-party app developers can uh, provide a national database of transportation services. So I guess it's not a question, um, but that is a good point and a goal to strive for. I don't know if um, Dan and Will or Judy, if you have any, we'll start with Will and Dan, if you have any comments from your research about that, um, about that issue for a national uh, standards and for a national database. Well, I think you know. You, I think the, the the suggestion is a good one, and starts with open architecture. And I think that was one of the hallmarks of some of the advanced systems that we described. That it it doesn't try and reinvent the wheel, but tries to create the links, sometimes via API links, to get to uh, to, to make use of existing trip planning and scheduling systems. And if everybody used that kind of approach then suddenly some kind of standardization um, might be in the cards and, and uploading the information much like the NTD data. There's, there's also um, uh, uh, public uh, transit currently uses a standard called GTFS. Um, and GTFS is basically the uh, that allows Google Maps and the apps to um, get access to both, you know, uh, uh, public transit schedules and real time tracking information um, in a way. And there is effort underway to expand to uh, non fixture um, So there's definitely some efforts. Um, and it's called GTFS Plus. Um, and there's, so there's definitely some efforts to start standardizing information about some specialized transportation services. And there's a lot more opportunities to do something. And this is Judy, and I, I totally agree. I think that um, you know our society is mobile across borders, across states, so that is really important. Um, two things come to mind in any interface of these um, technologies make sure and ensure that it's accessible from the get-go to people with disabilities, people with visual disabilities, um, that it's screen reader accessible. And the second thing um, we need to think about is the um, open sourcing across industries. It, for instance, when you're making a doctor's appointment, a follow-up doctor's appointment in the schedule or at the hospital is making that appointment, wouldn't it be great if at the same time there was information pulled up related to the mobility options that were available to that patient as they were exiting so that it, there could be some certainty to, to best there is that there's transportation available for that follow-up appointment. That's a really good point. Um, thank you, Judy. Um, so if anyone has any other questions, feel free to type them in or you can raise your hand. Uh, this was a lot of information and really promising things happening to get the word out about what, um, what trip availability is out there. And um, uh, you should all check out the toolkit. So we'll see if there's any other questions. One of the points that we were kind of pressed for time, but it's a very important point, is sometimes um, the evaluation criteria gets overlooked and almost becomes, oh, yeah, we got to do that in a year. You need to go into these designs and all those, just that seven set of decisions that Dan was talking about by thinking somebody a year from now is going to ask you, so has this been successful? And what are you going to tell them? And that's why you need to, and this, this is why one of the many reasons the toolkit is very helpful, because it goes through specific performance metrics and evaluation criteria that's pertinent to each level of functionality. And if you use that in the design and the collection of data, then a year from now when they ask you that question, you'll be able to answer it. Excuse me. Um, 
one thing is maybe you could explain a little bit how um, non-state DOTs um, would utilize the toolkit. Um, I'm thinking maybe NPOs or transit agencies or other organizations that maybe just speak about that for a moment. There, there, there's no distinction between them. Yeah. What, what, what we're talking about is if a region unto it itself decides that they want to do something like this, every part of the report and every part of the toolkit will be applicable to them. There's, there's no distinction. Um, while there have been several states that have served as the leads for those VTCLI grants, many of them wound up um, doing regional approaches to them, but still they served as the leads and they were the common support. So it's really, um, it, 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 we, 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 when we were doing the report, we soon figured out that this really isn't just for state DOTs, it's for regions and even counties. So. Um, it was written with that in mind. Great. Thank you so much. Well, um, I'm not getting any other questions, and I think it was uh, such an informative presentation, both of them, and I really appreciate everyone joining today and sticking around. Um, I'm just going to end here, and if you have any follow-up questions for me, um, again, I'm Liz Taylor at National RTAP, and our website and Facebook page are listed. We will have a recording of this if you want to share it with any of your colleagues. Um, and we're happy to take questions after the fact. If you think of any, um, I can uh, forward them to Will and Dan and Judy. Um, and we'll be sending a survey tomorrow. We'd appreciate your feedback. Um, but thank you again for joining us. And um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Judy, Will, and Dan. Great presentations today. Welcome. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.